For as long as I can remember, I have loved Election Day. When I was a kid, I used to follow my parents into the voting booth, pushing each little red button with intense focus. After we got home, my parents and I would sit in the kitchen and talk about how their small decisions and those little buttons linked to big decisions happening at the highest levels of government. On my 10th birthday, my grandfather gave me a blank index card and told me to write the top five things that I wanted to be when I grew up. Next to teacher and ballerina, I wrote that I wanted to work at the White House. Now, maybe this was because I grew up in a family that watched the West Wing every week. But I like to think that it's because of all of those times that I'd followed my parents into the voting booth. My grandfather took that index card, dated it, and sealed it in an envelope, which I promptly forgot about. But I found that envelope stuffed in the back of a bookshelf 14 years later, one month after being offered a job at the White House. Now, anyone who knows me could tell you that my childhood love of government has only grown. And to this day, I do still love to vote. But most people don't share my enthusiasm. In fact, voter turnout in US midterm elections tends to hover just below 40%. If someone can win with the plurality of the votes, that means that they can get elected to lead with the support of less than 20% of their constituents. Now, you may be asking, why does this matter for me? I want you to take a moment and think of the products and services that you use every day. Who provides them? Raise your hand if you're thinking of a big tech company right now. OK, most of us. Now raise your hand if you're thinking of government. One or two, but we've got some work to do. I've had a lot of conversations with my peers here at business school about the role of government. And many people have expressed that they don't see any connection between the actions they take and the outcomes that government provides. But in reality, the work of government touches each of our lives in countless ways that go beyond the headlines every single day. Let's take a look at your day today. Your alarm goes off. You look at the clock and get out of bed. You check your favorite weather app and maybe take a morning medication. Let's say that you scroll through notifications on your iPhone while eating your breakfast and decide to Google a particularly interesting news story before moving on with your day. Let's recap what just happened. Who set the time on your alarm clock? The National Institute of Standards and Technology, a US government agency. Your weather app is pulling data from the National Weather Service. And that medication, why did you assume that it's safe and effective? Because consciously or not, you have faith in the work of the Food and Drug Administration. As for that iPhone, do you know who provided the early stage financing for Apple? The US government's small business investment company program. Venture capitalists only started to take note after government funding got Apple to a proof of concept. And as for that Google search of the morning headline, it was possible in no small part because of the National Science Foundation, which funded the early work on Google's algorithm. A lot of people here in Silicon Valley see government as red tape and regulations. But that overlooks the massive role that government has played in spurring some of our most disruptive innovations. In many ways, the work of government is the invisible thread holding the fabric of society together. We haven't even left your house yet in the example that I just walked through. And there are millions of lives even more intimately touched by government every day through things like unemployment insurance, healthcare, and public education. But while its work touches each of our lives every day, whether we know it or not, too many of us remain uninterested in the public sector. Now, I recognize that government is not perfect. There are many improvements to be made in terms of efficiencies and user experience, let alone tangible policy outcomes. But in the same way that public companies need shareholders to provide accountability and counsel, government needs shareholders too. And that comes in the form of active civic engagement. There are countless ways to get involved. 
But the one that tends to come up the most is voting. Now, for any of you who may still be on the fence about the value of voting, I could give you an impassioned plea about how it's your duty given those who fought for your right to enter the voting booth. I could tell you about the importance of having a representative sample of the population vote so that our elected officials are actually representative of the general public. And for the more data-driven members of the audience, I could tell you that if you are in a swing state, the chance of your one vote changing the election outcome is actually 18 times better than your chance of winning the lottery. But beyond emotional and data-driven appeals, I would propose that there are two main reasons why it's crucial that you vote. First, oftentimes there are many things to vote for on a ballot beyond just people especially here in California. In this November's midterms, there were 11 different statewide propositions on California ballots, soliciting constituent input on everything from affordable housing to whether or not California should abandon daylight savings time. And these measures often do pass or fail on very thin margins. Second, politicians look at who votes. Whether or not you vote is a public record here in the United States. And that means that yes, your neighbors can know whether or not you voted in the most recent elections. But more importantly, it means that politicians know who voted and who did not. And especially at the local level when those same politicians are making decisions about different policies down the line, for better or for worse, they look at who voted last time as the projection for who's likely to vote next time. That means that if you want to be sure that your interests are heard in how your government operates, you have to take on the mantle of being an active citizen. Now, for those of you who already vote, government doesn't only need you on election day. There's a whole spectrum of ways to get involved the rest of the year, from calling your elected official and expressing support or concern for an issue, to volunteering for a local or national campaign that you're excited about, or getting involved in political tech and creating a digital solution to help government better serve the public. Maybe you help fund public-private partnerships to drive forward meaningful social change. Or maybe you even decide to run for office or otherwise do a tour of duty of sorts in government yourself. Today, roles in government are no longer limited to policy advisor, project coordinator, and legislative director. Today, roles in government include becoming a presidential innovation fellow, a user experience designer, or even chief technology officer of the United States. These are all real roles that real people hold in government. And all of them have been held by someone who decided to leave Silicon Valley for a few years and contribute their time and talents to the change that they wanted to see. Toward the end of my time at the White House, I found myself standing outside the Oval Office, waiting to begin my farewell meeting each staffer gets with the president. I was trying to remember to breathe as I nervously counted the stars and stripes on the lapel pin of the Secret Service officer across from me. Before I knew it, a staffer said next and ushered me into the Oval Office, where Barack Obama was standing in front of the Resolute desk. Now, I had played this moment over and over in my mind. I would thank him and explain what an honor it was to contribute in even a small way to his legacy. And he would thank me and congratulate me for my work. But what I remember most from our conversation that day is what President Obama said at the end. We shook hands to say goodbye and he paused and said there's more work to be done. Not thank you for what you have done and not congratulations, but there's more work to be done. There I was expecting to celebrate the team's accomplishments to date, only to have the leader of the free world remind me of the never ending list of problems yet to be solved. And that is a huge challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity and one in which all of us can play a part. You may have heard John F. Kennedy's quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. 
but I don't think that's quite right. Yes, you should ask what you can do for your country, but you should also never stop asking what your country can do for you. Because if we start thinking about that, if we start expecting more and seeing ourselves as shareholders in government, then we can truly bring our government to its fullest potential together. Because in the end, there's always more work to be done. Thank you. Thank you.